Cool. So the title of this talk is The Truth About Mentoring Minorities, uh, and hopefully you're in the correct room uh, to hear the right talk. Uh, so to start off, I'm going to tell you all a bit about myself. First off, my name is Byron Woodfork. Uh, I am a software crafter for the company known as 8th Light. We are a consulting company uh, with our main office based out of Chicago. However, I happen to be moving to our Los Angeles office as of next week. So if you're an LA uh, resident, feel free to say hi as I could use uh, all the new friends I could get. <laughs> uh, and there is uh, my Twitter handle as well. It's just my first and last name. Uh, so to start off, I'm gonna talk to you all about how I became a software crafter. And to do that, I actually have to do a bit of a rewind uh, back in time. And for those of you that were around computers in like the late 90s, early 2000s, you probably recognize this piece. Uh, this is a compact desktop Rosario, and this was my first computer ever. Uh, someone actually, <laughs> Someone actually gave me this computer, uh, or gave it to my mom, my mom gave it to us, and I just like was so fascinated. I wanted to learn the ins and outs. I wanted to learn everything there was to learn about this computer and computers in general. So I deconstructed it, I reconstructed it, I spent like hours upon hours learning about the operating system and things of that nature. And fast forward a bit, I eventually uh, found myself in college and I remember having to choose between majors, and I was like, all right, like there's computer science, and there's these other majors who knows what they are, don't really care, but I really want to do computer science. However, I was under the notion that to like major in computer science, you had to be ridiculously smart and or ridiculously good at math. And I felt like I did not match the bill in terms of that, so I actually talked myself down from majoring in computer science. And that's probably why college didn't exactly pan out for me. <laughs> that uh, accompanied with uh, like lack of funds and just lack of passion to like pursue what I was doing. I think I was like majoring in biology or something like that. Uh, I don't really remember. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> upon uh, dropping out of college, I actually found myself working full time at Best Buy. Uh, this isn't exactly what I dreamed in terms of breaking into the tech industry, but I <laughs> found myself here anyway. And in working at Best Buy, I remember one day I was like listening to like some motivational speech or something like that. And as I was listening to it, I remember something clicked and I knew that, I realized that this was not how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. I realized that I was not chasing my dreams in the way that I thought that I would when I was younger. And with that in mind, I got it in my mind that I was gonna break into the tech industry and I was gonna find some way to do it. So I researched some careers and I landed upon software developer. And for those of you that are familiar with MySpace or you know, uh, did some work with MySpace like in the like mid to late 2000s, or yeah, about mid 2000s, uh, you may, remember uh, that you could build like MySpace layouts uh, using HTML and CSS. And I was actually really good at that back in the day. So I was like, hey, like I used to be really good at building MySpace layouts, so becoming a software developer should be pretty easy. Not too far from that, right? <laughs> and I eventually found out that wasn't exactly as easy as I would hope. Uh, but Nevertheless, I continued my path forward and I started teaching myself how to code through various sites such as Code Academy, for instance, and various other tutorial sites out there. And in doing so, I eventually came to the conclusion that this still wasn't gonna be as easy as I was hoping, hoping for it to be. Uh, and upon uh, coming to that realization, I actually started reaching out to some friends uh, like pretty much anyone that I could find that may know someone that's in the software industry. Uh, and I just kept asking questions. And eventually I found someone, it was actually a friend of mine, a guy by the name of Dave Moore. And I remember talking to Dave and we were exchanging conversation and I kept asking him questions about software related matters and he kept responding. And I was like, as long as this guy keeps responding, I'm gonna keep asking questions. <laughs> like, and eventually, Dave realized that I wasn't going to go away. And I remember he invited me out to his company, a company known as 8th Light, uh, out in Chicago. And 
<clears throat> he said, uh, we have public meetups on Friday, so you should come out and we can talk more about software-related matters. And I was like, heck yeah, man, I'm coming out like ASAP. I called up Best Buy, I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to come in and work on Friday. Click, uh, <laughs> didn't really give them an ex explanation. I was just like, like straight path forward to uh, like breaking into the software industry, at least that's how I saw it anyway. Uh, so after the meetup, uh, while we were at uh, the company known as Eighth Light, uh, Dave talked to me about what was called, or what he referred to as an apprenticeship. And I was pretty fam unfamiliar uh, with the term. And he explained what it was. And what basically what the apprenticeship is, is the company will bring in people like myself who had little to no experience, or senior developers as well, uh, into the company and teach them how to either build software or how to be software craft, uh, craftspeople as we uh, like to refer to them as software crafters, and essentially like get them to this level of writing clean code. And when he told me this, like, I was like, okay, that's awesome. And he offered me the position to become a software apprentice under him. And I was like, and immediately when he said that, like, of course, like, I'm like, yes, like, whatever will get me out of my job at Best Buy, like, whatever will break me into the tech industry, I'm all for it. I didn't even think about asking questions about like being paid or anything like that. I was probably willing to pay him at that point. <laughs> you know, so, and luckily, uh, the apprenticeship actually involved, as he informed me, that the company would actually pay me to learn. And this seemed kind of sketchy. <laughs> I'm like, you all are gonna pay me to learn software all right, like whatever, like I'm, I'm down for it. Like it doesn't matter, like I was willing to pay you, I was willing to work for free if need be. Uh, so that's 10 times better, right? So, uh, and like that's pretty much how I became an apprentice and eventually I would graduate and become a software crafter uh, for the company. So that in a nutshell is how I became a software crafter for the company known as Eighth Light. And I remember somewhere around the time that I graduated uh, my apprenticeship, I was engaged in a, a pretty interesting discussion with someone uh, that I had just come, in, come to know recently. And the person asked me a question. Uh, we were at, like, the conversation topic revolved around like racial relations in our country. And the person asked me a question. He said, why aren't more African-American people more successful like yourself? Like, you brought yourself up, uh, you're from Chicago, you're from a not so great neighborhood, you lived below the poverty line when you were a kid, like, why is it that you were able to become a success within the software industry when so many other people haven't? And like this question really plagued me and it struck me and I had to explain to the person, I had a lot of things that a lot of people that I knew and grew up with simply didn't, right? Like I was one of the lucky ones in that regard. And after that conversation, I really wanted to pinpoint exactly what it was that I had and exactly where my life changed for the better and essentially uh, made me who I am today. So <clears throat> in coming to that conclusion, hopefully I could help other people like me uh, essentially become successful in the software industry as well. Now, many people wonder why minorities aren't succeeding in their respective companies. Many people wonder what's stopping us from breaking the upper management barrier once we are in these software development uh, companies. And once we're at these companies, what's preventing us from becoming software developers or becoming team leads or becoming executives within our respective companies? In lieu of, in lieu of all this, I ask myself the question, where is the gap for minorities in our industry and how can I help close it? And eventually it clicked and I realized exactly where things changed for me. I realized where my life changed. And that brought me to the realization that the solution to breaking the barrier for minorities within the tech industry is providing a strong network of mentors to support them. And now you might be saying to yourself, well, my company hired minority employees and they still left, or my company hired minority employees and they're unhappy, or my company hired minority employees and they couldn't make it up the corporate ladder. And there's a reason for that. 
For years, we've been teaching everyone exactly the same. For years, we've been bringing in protégés and apprentices and teaching them exactly the same. For years, we've literally been duct typing our teachings to these protégés. And the problem with that is you simply cannot duct type people. You can't duct type software developers. We can't expect everyone to respond to the same type of mentoring. So a contributing factor as to why you'll get people that are unhappy at their jobs uh, and essentially get frustrated and leave is that you're teaching them in the exact same way. And it's simply not effective for everyone. Our industry is changing, and because of that, we need to change with it. And the way that we change is that we change the way that we mentor our protégés and apprentices. Mentors must be willing to adjust their teaching styles to the, to essentially adjust their teaching styles to the uniqueness that comes with mentoring someone who's a minority. And in doing so, we must also become aware of the challenges that minorities face, as well as the challenges that we face when mentoring someone who is a minority. And to do that, we can uh, take a step back and look at some of the data uh, when it comes to minorities involved in the tech industry. And first off, let's take a look at some of the diversity numbers amongst tech employees. Uh, companies such as Intel, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. And if we look at the diversity numbers, we'll see that the largest bar, obviously, uh, male uh, employees at these companies. And then we can look at next, the women at these companies as well. And as you can see, much noticeably lower. And next, uh, the race. And majority of the people at each one of these companies is, of course, the average uh, white person. And if you break out your microscopes, uh, you can see the really sad number of black people that are actually employed at these companies as well. Uh, and the same goes for Hispanic and people that label themselves as others. So <clears throat> companies in our industry are struggling to retain minority employees. Like the CEO of Intel simply just has no idea, or he said he has no idea as to why they're losing African-American employees at an alarming rate. And to look at uh, things such as how often people quit, uh, we have a graph that shows the predicted job quit rate uh, for people across race. Now, if we look at the predicted quit rate for someone who is white, uh, you'll see it's just below 4%. And if we look at the predicted quit rate for someone who is African American, you'll see it's noticeably larger, uh, just below 5%, and the same goes for Hispanic Americans. Now, if we take a look at that, like this pretty much has everyone uh, associated in terms of male and female. However, what happens if we have someone who is a dual minority? Say, someone who is an African American woman, for example or someone who's a Hispanic American woman, for example. The predicted job quit rate in compared to men for African American women is actually 61% greater, and for Hispanic American women, 67% greater. Why is this? Well, one of the main reasons is, according to research, whites and minorities do not progress up the corporate ladder in the same way. Whites are more likely to be placed on a fast track to an executive position within their company than a person of color, whereas people of color tend to plateau in middle management during their careers at the same companies as their white peers. And as a result, many people get frustrated and essentially leave their company. And unfortunately, this creates a domino effect. And the domino effect is in that you have these minority employees that plateau in their careers and eventually leave your company, and that leaves you with less and less minority employees for other entry-level employees to actually look up to. So it makes it more difficult for people to build relationships with people that look like them and or resemble them. And speaking from experience, it's honestly just comforting knowing that there's someone at the company that looks like me and actually did something in the company, made it up the corporate ladder. <clears throat> One of the questions that I ask myself for any company that I'm going to apply for is, how many people at this company look like me? 
How many people have built successful careers at this company look like me? And how many people have become executives at this company look like me? And it's far too often that that answer is no one. And this can be disheartening to a lot of people. However, there are companies that actually see minorities succeed and break that upper management barrier. So what sets them apart from the rest? How are some companies succeeding in retaining minority employees? And for the minority employees that re uh, are retained at these companies, what's keeping them motivated to essentially achieve something greater within the company? In asking myself these questions, I came across a bit of research, and the research was conducted on the career progression of minority employees uh, within corporate America. <clears throat> and the research came to several conclusions, but one of the most notable conclusions was that the minority employees who were the most successful, one thing that they had in common was a strong network of mentors to support them. Whites are more likely to be placed on a fast track to executive positions, as I mentioned earlier, whereas minorities weren't necessarily fast tracked. However, even though they weren't fast tracked, at these companies where minorities were successful, their, their mentors invested in them as if they would be fast tracked. So even though they plateaued for much longer than their peers who were white, they still invested in them. Their mentors continuously invested in them. And in turn, this helped prevent uh, people from leaving the company and or uh, decreasing their work performance. So this was my first mentor at 8th Light, a guy by the name of Dave Moore. Dave mentored me individually for several months, uh, and he also brought in Malcolm to be my co-mentor. And around like four months or so into my apprenticeship, uh, Dave introduced me to this guy, Paul Pagel. And I remember the conversation Dave and I had Dave said, hey, Byron, do you know what Scope is in Ruby? And at the time, I was still pretty green, like I was still really new to uh, programming aspects in Ruby in general, so I said, no, I don't know what Scope is in Ruby. Uh, so he said, awesome, because I set up a one-on-one -on -one with you and the CEO of the company for him to explain to you what Scope is in Ruby. <laughs> and I was like, what? The CEO of the company? Like, CEO of the company is gonna teach me Ruby, like, who am I? I'm nobody, right? Like, that's what was going through my mind. And uh, so I, like, I found that re really awesome. And Dave introduced me to several other people as well who would eventually become my co-mentors uh, within the company of 8th Light. And if ever there were a question that Dave felt that he weren't as knowledgeable as someone else on the topic, he would actually put me in touch with several other people at the company that could explain it either different from him or much better than him or whatever the case may be. And if he ever felt that I was leaning on him too much for answers, he would continuously have me go out to people that I generally was uncomfortable going out to uh, and not confident in actually asking questions. And he'd make me ask, ask these people these questions. And in turn, this helped me build relationships within the company, helping build my network of mentors and contribute to my success in the company. And also, so to be completely successful as mentors, we must also become aware of the challenges that we face when mentoring someone who's a minority. And with that, we have challenges and opportunities. And according to research, minorities who plateaued in their careers received mentoring that was basically instructional. However, the most successful minorities who actually broke the uh, career barrier they received mentoring that was more than instructional. They received closer, fuller, developmental relationships with their mentors. So purely instructional mentoring wasn't sufficient enough, sufficient enough for minorities. Protégés needed to feel connected to their mentors. Research shows that cross-race as well as cross-gender relationships can have difficulty forming. However, most mentorships must be cross-race or cross-gender. And as a result, you have the possibility of situations such as negative stereotypes, for example. Mentors must be willing to give 
their protege the benefit of the doubt, investing in them because we expect them to succeed. A potential mentor who holds a negative stereotype, perhaps based on race, may withhold his support for his protege until his protege proves himself or herself worthy. Such subtle racism as that may help explain why the minorities in the research that I mentioned earlier weren't fast-tracked in the same way that white people were in the companies that they worked for. Whites were placed on a fast track based on their perceived potential, whereas minorities had to prove a solid and sustained record of performance over time. So in turn, minorities actually had to be over-prepared for the same positions that their white peers were actually being granted. When we as minorities feel like we aren't given the benefit of the doubt, we might become more reserved in our actions for fear that we might fail or be disciplined at something or for something we do or say. And stereotypes have also proven to actually reduce performance uh, within the workplace. And that actually brings me to an idea, and the idea is what's known as stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is when people feel themselves to be at risk of conforming to stereotypes uh, about their social group. And to elaborate on this, uh, there were the psychologists at Stanford, uh, and they were actually conducting this uh, case research study. And the case research, uh, case research study involved them uh, grabbing both men and women, and they placed them into a room. And the men and women that they grabbed had equal levels of math skills. So upon pl placing them into the room, they actually gave uh, everyone standardized math tests, and they had them take the tests. And they noticed something that actually repeated itself. They noticed that women actually underperformed on the standardized math tests, even though they were of equal skill level to all the men in the room as well. And the psychologists couldn't actually figure out why. It took them a while uh, before they actually had an idea. And the idea was, hey, maybe there's a stereotype threat that's happening that we aren't seeing, specifically the stereotype that women aren't as good as men in standardized math tests. So they actually recreated the same environment, the same experiment. They placed the men and the women in the room again, gave them the standardized math tests, except this time they did something different. This time, before they took the test in front of everyone in the room, they said, I know you may have heard that women aren't as good as men on standardized math tests. However, that's not true for this particular test. For this particular test, women actually perform just as well as the men. And in saying just those few words, the women actually brought their scores up and performed just as well as the men. So if you caught that, there was that stereotype threat that they just had looming in the back of their mind, something that you just don't necessarily think of, something that like, is unconscious, like it's not something that you think of on a regular basis. And it can definitely, as proven in the case study, lower your performance on the job. <clears throat> and in talking about that, this leads me to something that is referred to as being a coach and a counselor uh, for your protege. And to explain, a coach gives technical advice while a counselor talks about the emotional experience of something. <clears throat> And I'm going to tell you all the story about, essentially, me working for 8th Light and my first days of coming in 8th Light. I remember every day I come into work, I came into work with just one goal, and that goal was to make sure that I didn't get fired. Like, you laugh, but I was, I'm so serious. <laughs> uh, like, every day I came into work with imposter syndrome, like, surely everyone else here is better at software development than I am. Like, I'm sitting next to people that came out of dev boot camp and paid like 10, 20 grand uh, to come out of dev boot camp, and I just came off of Code Academy trying to teach myself how to write an if statement, right? Like, I'm sitting next to people that went to college and got computer science degrees, people that are already five or 10 years into their software development careers and their apprentices as well. 
Like, I was feeling inadequate. And eventually, like, all of this anxiety built up, and I informed my mentor, and he told me something that actually shocked me. Like, he told me that he also felt the same way I did when he was an apprentice. And this was, like, super shocking to me in the fact that I knew how much experience he had coming in the eighth flight. He had several years of experience, really smart guy. And I was like, all right, like, if he felt the same way I did, maybe I'm just, like, going crazy. Maybe I actually have this. And he told me that I did. He told me and informed me that I was good enough to be at the company, good enough to work here, and that I was progressing in my career, essentially being, a, being a, an apprentice and becoming a software developer. So to be effective mentors for minorities, we must play, both play the role of coaching, coaching counselor, not only teaching the technical things, but also being someone that can listen, someone that can actually connect to our uh, protégés on that emotional level as well. Because it's too often that minorities feel like outcasts. It's too often that they feel like they don't have anyone to relate to. And while there might not be someone at your company that looks like your minority or protege, that doesn't mean you can't be there for them emotionally. And something else that comes to mind when it comes to matching up people with mentors is the idea of identification and role modeling. And what I mean by that is you essentially want to have someone that a protege can identify with for them to be taught by. Now, Dave and I, we had similar feelings of emotion going through our apprenticeship. While we're on completely different technical levels, we actually experienced similar struggles in going through our apprenticeship. And that allowed us to essentially connect and identify with each other. And he was already my role model because I remember <laughs> he took me to his place and I was like, dude, like this is a huge place, like this is a nice place, you're a software developer, like you're a rock star, at least that's how I saw it in my mind. So he was already my role model. He was doing these awesome things, giving talks and whatnot and teaching people. And I was like, that is the life that I wanna have. So he was already my role model. <clears throat> so in identification and role modeling, it also means that a mentor sees someone that reminds himself or herself of themselves in previous times, or is an apprentice sees someone that reminds him or herself of themselves in the future. Now, I mentioned before, many relationships must be cross-race or cross-gender, or many mentorships, I should say. And because of this, this brings about the idea and opportunity for something that's referred to as protective hesitation. And protective hesitation is when you view your relationship with someone as more fragile than others and fear that you might offend that person from something you do or say. And to elaborate on this, there's a case study where there was a white mentor who had a minority protege and he felt as though his minority protege style was too abrasive, like he was too rude and generally not a great person to work with. However, he never told his protege this for fear that he might sound prejudiced, specifically that he'd harbored the stereotype that all black men are rude or disrespectful. And the mentor eventually found out that he was right when his protege became an issue with other people at the company. And by that time, it was too late. His protege had been deemed a problem. <clears throat> so, in terms of discussing race, and in terms of just racial relations, period, people believe that they aren't supposed to discuss race. And if we have to discuss it, then it must be a problem. However, that's not the case. Relationships where mentor and protege can actually actively discuss race can lead to greater opportunities for their protege. And some people will argue that discussing race might make people feel othered, and that doesn't have to be the case. When we're open to discussing race, 
we're helping inspire our minority uh, apprentices to take hold of something that makes them unique as individuals. I had a, uh, had a, co a conversation with one of my mentors and I remember him saying that, he said, Byron, like, I don't know if you're aware, but there aren't many people in the software industry that look like you. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I kind of knew that. <laughs> I thought he was joking, uh, but he was actually serious. He was uh, making a point. He said, there aren't many people in the software industry that look like you. And if you wanted to take it upon yourself to essentially become someone that other people look up to and and essentially teaching people uh, software development, like that could be really huge for yourself as well as several other people that are looking to break into the software industry. Like you could be their inspiration, that person that they connect to on that level. So d discussing race actually is one of the huge, well, one of the main reasons that I'm actually up here because my mentors inspired me to actually give this talk. So all in all, uh, we've discussed things such as the career progression of both uh, whites and minorities. Uh, we've discussed that whites are more likely to be placed on a fast track within, a, uh, within corporate America than that of a minority. We've also discussed the <clears throat> diversity numbers among several tech employees and discussed essentially people having issues retaining employees at their companies. And to back that up, we've also discussed ways that we can help change those things. We've discussed that we can build strong network, uh, strong mentor networks for our apprentices. We've discussed that we can become coaches and counselors for our apprentices as well. We've also discussed the possibility of negative stereotypes in the workplace as well as the stereotype threat. We've also discussed the ability to identify and become role models for our apprentices. And we've discussed the idea of protective hesitation. And the goal of this talk was to essentially answer this question. Where is the gap for minorities and how can I help close it? And I think successfully, like answered that question, at least on one aspect, building, strong network, building a strong network of mentors for our apprentices. So that concludes the talk. Um, <clears throat> uh, to wrap this up, I'd actually like to discuss uh, this last one thing with you all. Uh, at 8th Light, we've always had an apprenticeship model. And it wasn't until recent time that we actually had this crazy idea of not only just bringing apprentices into the company for us to teach, but to actually bring apprenticeship programs to other companies. So essentially, if you were a company that had like a group of developers who were either junior or senior level and wanted to either learn about some new technology or they wanted to learn how to become leaders within the technology space, uh, we're actually working on this new project whereas we'll actually teach a group of developers from your company uh, how to do that. And right now, uh, the project is called Develop. It's a working title. Uh, we really don't have a specific title yet. I wanted to go with uh, Bartik after, uh, I believe, Susan Bartik, who is awesome. <laughs> but apart from that, if you have any questions in regards to this uh, or anything else for that matter, feel free to see me. Uh, and that is it. And I am willing to take questions as well. Yeah, so like I think one of the the things about my mentorship that really helped me out in that regard, uh, or I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. Uh, you said, what are some things that uh, you can do to help you and your apprentice uh, identify with each other and discuss and essentially become more open, correct? All right, so one of the things that really helped me in that regard was that my mentor and I would actually like just talk after work, right? Like we just talk about whatever. And like 
while we were friends before I got to A-Flight, once he became my mentor, it was kind of intimidating. Like, it was weird. Like, I, I feel like I couldn't open up to him anymore once he became my mentor, but eventually uh, we got to that point. Uh, and it was honestly just a matter of, like, him showing me that he was a real person, uh, <laughs> him opening up to me about uh, ways that he felt, things that he felt, and that allowed me to feel like I could trust him enough to actually open up to him. So essentially, like, I feel like the more that you pour into someone, uh, the better your relationship can be, and that'll allow people to feel like they can trust you and open up to you as well. Right, so, <clears throat> like, you would essentially like to reach out to the uh, minority developers that you have on your team uh, at your company, correct? Yeah, so with that, like, there can be, like, several ways to do that, and essentially uh, making sure that you can retain uh, your minority employees. And you said there's, like, five of them? Yeah, five out of 100 on our Okay, and they're all of equal uh, levels within the company? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in that regard, like, it can be pretty difficult uh, when something, or when someone's starting out, uh, because, like, there's no one for them to look up to in terms of people that look like them. Uh, so one thing that I always suggest in that aspect is to actually find people uh, outside of your company, not necessarily to even hire, but people to maybe come in and like give a talk, uh, people for them to network with, right? Uh, so that they can like build those uh, mentor uh, uh, relationships. And in terms of like you, uh, like making them feel welcome, just like talk to them about like things, like ask them what are their concerns with the company, right? Like ask them where do they wanna be? And if they open up to you in that regard, then you can say, all right, like, let's start making some plans to like, get you to where you wanna be. Because it's really often that people just won't ask those questions and or uh, they'll ask the questions and the people will tell them and they're like, okay, well, all right, uh, don't really have too much to tell you, but like, you'll, get the, you'll get somewhere eventually. Like, pretty much just like working with them, right? And like making them feel like they're a part of the team and a part of the company and someone that matters. All right, so to repeat the question, uh, she said that she has a woman of color within her group of women software developers. Yeah, and, and you don't wanna like make her responsible for educating you on like challenges that she faces uh, in the industry. Yeah, so like to start with that, that's like, making sure that your team actually, one, believes in the idea of becoming educated uh, on like challenges that she'll face on a regular basis, right? Uh, it starts with you all. And if you can like even talk to her or like give presentations for that matter on challenges that uh, minorities face on a regular basis, like that's like really huge. Like that makes us like feel like we're not alone uh, in like this struggle to like break into the tech industry and actually succeed, right? So as long as you all were to attack it in that aspect and actually be proactive and not reactive uh, and not like put the burden completely on her to inform you all of like ways that she might feel or things that she, or challenges that she might face, right? So. Uh, so yeah, so the question revolved around if you're looking for, or if you're either not employed or you don't have a strong network uh, or mentor network at your current workplace, uh, what can you do to uh, make it so that you do? All right, uh, yeah, so in that aspect, like one thing that I always tell people to keep in mind, even if you have employees at your company uh, that have strong networks of mentors, like try to encourage them to, or like you essentially put it on yourself as a mentor or as an apprentice uh, to like reach out to other people uh, outside of the company that you either work for or if you're actually unemployed, then I'd honestly just start reaching out to just like people that I admire, right? Like I've, re I've reached out to several people that like were just role models to me uh, in the software industry and actually have gotten replies back. Uh, people that would like happily discuss like progressing up the uh, software development uh, ladder. 
uh, and breaking into the tech industry and stuff like that. So as long as um, like you can like muster up the courage to actually talk to these people, a lot of them will actually reply. A lot of them are really helpful and uh, willing to teach. Local user groups, yeah, that's a huge thing too. Yeah, just like going to meetups, uh, anything within the community, uh, things that are uh, preferably free, <laughs> and, uh, and like you, you can meet a lot of really cool people there. Uh, a lot of people that actually uh, got employed at Eighth Light uh, met someone at meetups. So, All right. So to repeat the question, uh, <clears throat> she said that she has a coworker. Uh, who was being racist towards another minority coworker within the workplace, and she wasn't exactly sure how to handle uh, the issue. Um, so before going to HR, and I'm gonna tread lightly on answering this question because it's a very sensitive topic. <laughs> so before going to HR, I'd honestly talk to whoever was the first higher up uh, in, like, in charge of the team and actually let them know that it's making you feel uncomfortable like, put it on you. Don't say, oh, it's making this person feel uncomfortable, because maybe it's not. Maybe it's making you feel uncomfortable. And if that is the case, then it's their job to actually see to, to it that something is done about it. And in that regard, uh, when that person, uh, the, whoever the higher up is, uh, decides to go to HR, for example, uh, they'll say, like, hey, you actually had the problem with this person and what they were saying. And that way, you just completely take the burden off of the person that like you, you're seeing being abused, so. Sweet, thank you, I've never gotten that. <laughs> thank you all for the very thought-provoking questions, those were all.